All right, so um, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. My name is Jess Keeler, and I am the Contract Virtual Programs Coordinator at Griffin Art Projects. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the tsleil Squamish, and Stolo Nations. And Griffin Art, Art Projects is very grateful to undertake our work here. I'd also like to mention that um, our guest presenter today, David Craig, as well as myself, and perhaps uh, some of those joining us in the audience are from the East Coast. So I'd also like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that we are on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So I'm just gonna share my screen here for a moment. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Griffin Art Projects, we are an artist residency center and exhibition space in North Vancouver. And here are just some images of our current exhibition, Now Bulletin. Um, and Now Bulletin, which was curated by David McWilliam, features the archive collection and works of eminent Vancouver artist, Gary Neal Kennedy, who was the president of the Nova Scotia School of Art and Design for 23 years in Halifax. And so accompanying the exhibition, we have a robust lineup of public programs, such as today's presentation, that highlight and celebrate the legacy and careers of NASCAD grads across Canada and beyond. So we're very thrilled to have David Craig joining us here for a director's talk today. Now, before we jump into it, I just have a few housekeeping uh, comments or notes for those of you who might be new to Zoom. So this is a webinar format today, which means that you can see us, but we can't see or hear you, um, though we do invite you to get in touch with us through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And I'd also like to mention that um, David will be answering questions at the end of his presentation. And so we also have a question and answer function which is separate from the chat function and feel free at any point throughout today's presentation uh, to type your questions into that question and answer function as they come up and we'll be sure to get to them at the end of today's talk. So hopefully you've had a chance to watch the mill prior to today's event. Uh, if not, um, we sent out the link, it's available for streaming through CBC GEM. And I thought we'd just start by watching the trailer here before diving in. Okay, perfect. So I'm very thrilled to be introducing our guest presenter today. Based in Pictou County, Nova Scotia, David Craig is a co-founder of the independent documentary film company Sight Media and a producer on all eight of its films. Sight Media's last film, Strange and Familiar, Architecture on Fogo Island, won Best Atlantic Documentary at the 2015 Atlantic Film Festival and has screened around the world. Before heading to Toronto to work at the Ontario Arts Council and Telefilm Canada, he started his career in film in Halifax, working on William D. McGilvery's Life Classes, one of the first feature films to be made in Atlantic Canada. The Mill is his first credit as a director. The Mill was nominated for a Canadian Screen Award for Best Documentary Program and won the Environmental Award at the International Oceans Film Festival and the most inspirational feature at the Eugene Environmental Film Festival. So thank you so much, David, and over to you. Well, uh... I, I'm certainly honored to uh, speak as part of the uh, Now Bolton project uh, sponsored by uh, Griffin Art Projects. Uh, and I was also uh, a bit puzzled uh, in terms of trying to find what the connection uh, would be between the mill, the documentary that I directed in my history with NASCAD and with Gary Kennedy. Um, in many ways, my work as a filmmaker is a product of unlearning my fine art education, um, a casting away of the critical and abstract thinking that about making art um, that uh, was very much part of the NASCAD experience. I'm speaking from notes, so I had to write some of this out. Uh, because, uh, as I said, uh, you know, to try to find a through line between the mill and NASCAD was, uh, gave me pause and uh, I had to think about it because uh, really, uh, although there were, you know, and uh, I was part of my foundation course with Pat Kelly's early experiments with video and also, I mean, very influential, the visits of Robert Frank. Um, filmmaking and the uh, history of cinema really wasn't part of my NASCAD education. 
uh, a lot of that came subsequent to, uh, you know, my subsequent to graduating from NASCAD. Uh, and I don't think of the mill as an artwork, certainly not in the sense of the word uh, that I learned in art school. Uh, so in many ways, the mill is an antithesis of what I learned at NASCAD in as much as it's concerned with a very, very specific locale here in Nova Scotia and a very specific economic and political circumstance. In other words, it's not theoretically based, but it's intended to be a record of a specific place in a specific moment in time. My NASCAD education certainly immersed me in theory and in its considerations, but I, I'm not an academic. I didn't come out of the uh, my NASCAD experience as a theoretician or you know, somebody immersed in that. If anything, uh, my education inhibited any impulse to be a practicing artist. To do that seemed to require too much faith in myself and in art itself. I seem to end up in the contradictory position of being both a believer in art and a skeptic of it at the same time. And for me, this was the legacy of my NASCAD experience. And I wrestled it with this for most of my professional life in different ways. This was the quandary that I struggled to unlearn and perhaps was more successful in that in my filmmaking career than anything else. So in trying to come to terms with this whole idea of NASCAD and, and myself as a filmmaker and as a graduate, I, I have to thank my fellow NASCAD alumnus and my more theoretically inclined friend, Bob Bean, who uh, provided me with a clue to what connects the mill with my relationship to my NASCAD experience when he sent me the following quote from Theodore Adorno, who I have to admit, I haven't read him in any great detail. But it, it, the quote goes, objective realism was the first to stress vigorously the spiritual as against the sensual element of art. So I'll leave that with you for the moment, but I'll return to it later. And if I was to provide a title for the remarks today, I would borrow uh, from Magritte's famous painting from 1929, Cecina Pout and Peep. Uh, this is not a pipe, and that's the painting is also known as the treachery of images. So the Mill documentary was initiated in December of 2017. My partner, Catherine Knight, and I have been spending summers in Pictou County, Nova Scotia, for 15 years at that point. Um, we were aware of the mill, but really not directly affected by it or concerned with it to any great degree, even though it was only six or seven kilometers away from where we spent our time here. However, in 2014, the conflict within Pictou County about the mill really began to escalate. There was a spill from the effluent pipe from Boat Harbor on Pictou Landing and on traditional Mi'kmaq territory. And as a result, there was a blockade that was instituted by the Pictou Landing First Nation. And that resulted in the mill temporarily closing because they could not pump effluent through their pipe to Boat Harbor. And despite threats from, uh, of a lawsuit from the mill owners and pressure from the provincial government, uh, the blockade succeeded in getting a promise from the provincial government that they would address the boat harbor issue that had been going on since the mill was instituted in 1967. And uh, that, promise came from uh, the newly elected Premier Stephen McNeil. And uh, also in 2014, the mill uh, has 
was having a huge impact on the town of Picto because they had uh, their treatment technology for the airborne uh, pollution from the mill had been uh, scheduled to be replaced. And uh, there was a huge delay in that and they kept operating the mill without any effective technology to treat the airborne effluent from the mill. And that it was enormously uh, affecting the town of Picto and uh, unbelievable amounts of uh, airborne pollution were descending on the town and creating havoc. And it, that really instituted, uh, uh, again, a, a widespread popular protest that culminated that year uh, with a Clean the Air concert organized by local musicians uh, and uh, attracted thousands of people to the Picto, land, to the Picto Harbor Front in protest of the mill's operation and a demand that the mill clean up uh, its operation and stop the, uh, the pollution that was going on. So there was a mounting concern on the environmental impact of the, of the mill in 2014. In 2015, the province of Nova Scotia passed the Boat Harbor Act, which uh, instituted the closure of the Boat Harbor treatment facility, the treatment facility for the water effluent from the mill. And that closure was to be instituted in January, 2020. So in December, 2017, the mill announced uh, its plan to replace the Boat Harbor uh, facility with a new treatment facility. And this plan involved constructing a pipe that ran 14 kilometers from the mill's location at Abercrombie across Picto Harbor uh, through uh, Picto proper and down the Trans Canada Highway to Caribou Harbor, which was a major fishing point um, for the local lobster fishery and also the departure point for the ferry uh, to Prince Edward Island, so also a very big tourist area. The effluent uh, pipe would exit on the other side of uh, Caribou Harbor and in fact was approximately two kilometers as the crow flies from where we lived in Caribou. So it had a very personal impact as well as an impact on the entire county. Um, it was also in the fall of 2017 that Joan Baxter published her book, The Mill, 50 Years of Pulp and Pro uh, Protest, which uh, very thoroughly outlined the history of the mill from its in inception in 1967 uh, up to the moment uh, where, um, and over the 50 years of protest, especially from the Picto Landing First Nation, who uh, had um, the, the waterways, the, the uh, tidal, uh, estuarial tidal pool of Boat Harbor adjacent to their community, appropriated by the mill, by the province, by the government of Canada to be designated as the effluent treatment facility. Uh, and basically uh, robbed them of a, of, a, of, a, of a resource where that was very important to them. And uh, overnight, that body of water was transformed into a cesspool. Um, so that confluence of events, I could clearly see as a conflict of, an, of historical proportion and import, not only in Picto County, and not only in Nova Scotia, but it was really uh, resonant with concerns about the resource industry and its impact. And especially in a country like Canada, where the resource industry is, is a paramount economic driver. Um, and these issues were also being undertaken all across the globe. So it, I really felt that this was a story that brought together a lot of the issues confronting uh, not only Canadians, but people all over the world. It was 
uh, a lot of the resource industry impacts on, on uh, indigenous peoples. Um, the, uh, the resource industry of both fishing and forestry were uh, coming to, uh, conf into conflict uh, in a very rare instance. Um, and so the, simple, the, the uh, announcement by the mill that they were going to put this pipe into the fishing grounds of Caribou Harbor really uh, uh, sparked uh, a huge response, particularly from the fishermen, but also from all of the community that supported the fishermen and uh, drew a, a line in the sand between fishermen and the other traditional resource economy of Nova Scotia, which was the forest sector. And uh, the simple dichotomy of a pipe or no pipe held huge stakes for the future. If the mill was allowed to build a pipe, uh, a large and important swath of Picto County would be transformed into a catchment area for the mill's effluent treatment facility. Uh, if the pipe was disallowed, uh, the 50 year environmental uh, legacy of the mill would come to an end and accompanying that would be significant as economic uh, repercussions to the, uh, not only to the local workforce who worked at the mill, but also a province-wide forestry sector because uh, wood is cut all over the province and transported to the mill uh, and for the purposes of uh, making pulp. Uh, there was also truckers, uh, the Halifax Container Port. These were all impacted by uh, any potential loss to the, uh, the mill uh, because of the mill closing. Uh, so the pipe and no pipe conflict represented an alignment of forces that included coalition between indigenous and non-indigenous fishermen, um, townspeople, property owners, environmental advocates, uh, and against those, that uh, sector were uh, the mill itself with its uh, employees and its advocates, the ret retirees were uh, an important part of the community. And also its allies in the forestry sector, that would be sawmills and the employees, the forest uh, cutters, um, uh, truckers, heavy equipment operators, etc as well as the government through the Department of Resource and other commercial sectors who really depended on the mill. The mill was a half a billion dollar or more uh, economy in, a, in the province of Nova Scotia, that's very significant. However, at the same time, the lobster fishery of which the uh, uh, Northumberland Strait fishery was also a big driver. In fact, number one uh, uh, economic driver in the province of Nova Scotia. So it's really a historic, um, conflict uh, in, in as much as the uh, mill has had its way for 50 years over that uh, at Picto County and had, you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, worked in collaboration with all the other sectors. It was only at this point that, uh, that there was the, both the legacy of 50 years of economic, uh, of the pollution as well as the proposal that would threaten a proposal that would threaten the lobster fishery locally, that really brought things to a head. So I really felt that this was a strong documentary story um, and uh, a timely story, a story that could uh, you know be suitable for a television audience. Uh, I felt it had a good opportunity to get. Uh, um, financing and I felt very confident because of our uh, relationships in the community and, uh, and many of which involved uh, uh, fishermen that we would have uh, access to the people who were important to tell the story. So the documentary focuses on specifically on the pipe and no pipe conflict and I won't re recap the film other than to say it focuses on the characters that represent 
uh, picked the landing First Nation, the local lobster fisheries. We, uh, we really struggled to get representation from the mill, from the forestry sector. Um, and uh, also, you know, tried to get some, uh, you know, politicians like the premier involved uh, in telling the story of the mill. And the idea was really to, you know, to expose what the, what the conflict represented, who was being affected, how they perceived the issue, and uh, how they themselves articulated their positions. Um, because of the timing of the film, the decision about closing or extending the Boat Harbor treatment facility was made after the mill was finished. So that it didn't resolve um, you know, they, there was no ending that resolved what the outcome was going to be. It was left uh, hanging, as it were. So now, taking into account all that has transpired since the documentary was completed, I can um, reflect on the film outside of the urgency of making it. And in the context also of vastly changed circumstances, specifically the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Boat Harbor has closed. The mill has closed. Uh, there is now uh, no question that the economic and social and political status of the Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia have have taken on a, a totally different and dynamic role in the province. And, and uh, the most recent news uh, uh, from uh, about that is the takeover of Clearwater, uh, um, previously the most significant industrial fishery uh, and license holder in the province and its uh, sale to um, both a, pr a private sector branding company and 50% of, of that comp of the Clearwater Company is going to be owned by uh, a, a coalition of Mi'kmaq com communities. We're putting up a substantial amount of money to take over that company to a valuation of over a billion dollars. So uh, that has been, uh, you know, clearly etched into the current reality of Nova Scotia, along with the fact that uh, the town of Picto is, is enjoying a real estate boom and, and, and anticipating many more people are moving here. Uh, the economic devastation that was forecast to accompany the closure of the mill has not arrived. And ironically, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has increased the demand for lumber as people have been renovating and building uh, during this period. And the prices of wood have gone through the roof and the sawmills have uh, certainly not suffered economically uh, in the way they would have if, they, if, the, uh, if there wasn't an increase in the, in the marketplace for lumber. Uh, and of course, that, uh, that compensates for the loss of the mill. Uh, so nobody anticipated that happening. Clear cutting continues without let up in the province, uh, but the conversation around the role of industrial forestry in Nova Scotia has certainly changed uh, as protests mount over the government management of public lands and particularly uh, any remaining old growth forests. And so uh, the issue around the mill also was an issue around forestry and we'll come to that later as well. But from my perspective, the decision by Premier Stephen McNeil to hold firm on the closure date of Boat Harbor and force the mill to close was perhaps the most significant political act in Nova Scotia so far in this new century in terms of shaping the economic future of the province. Um, so in that respect, there has been a role of the no pipe protest in shaping that history. 
and shaping the outcome of that decision. But in retrospect, I wonder how seriously to take the proposal for a pipe in the North Northumberland Strait. Uh, the proposal was so over the top expensive and so environmentally risky and so poorly uh, uh, argued for by the mill owners that one has led to the uh, suspicion that it was a form of bully tactic uh, that was intended to uh, mainly to keep Boat Harbor open and operating so the owners of the mill could squeeze the last few years of profitability from a 50-year-old mill and a dwindling uh, resource, i.e. the forest uh, resource, because um, you know, the, the Nova Scotia has been logged for centuries and uh, the, the, there was some doubt whether there would be enough forest resource to keep that mill operating, even though the product of that mill continued to be uh, very much in demand in the marketplace and was, you know, by all uh, accounts, very profitable. And so it extends the extraordinary character of that political decision to close the mill. How rare is it that, uh, you know, a sitting politician will uh, basically shut down a going concern and a very vital part of the uh, provincial economy uh, under pressure to, uh, you know, uh, right a, a, a historic wrong under, that was um, afflicted to the uh, Pictou Landing First Nation. Uh, it was really quite extraordinary. But, you know, there is a still remaining a question whether uh, the, the threat of a pipe was used to, you know, basically leverage political advantage for the mill. Um, I also wonder if focusing on the no pipe protest means that other aspects of the story of the mill were left underdeveloped. There's a long history of protest that went back 50 years. Um, the devastating effect of the air uh, pollution probably in many ways uh, was even more extensive and uh, pervasive than the uh, pollution that would uh, come from the uh, removing and replacing the Boat Harbor treatment facility. I also don't have any illusions about the political efficacy of the documentary. I don't think that the documentary swayed the decision to close Boat Harbor. I think that, you know, that the work of local uh, organizers and the grassroots work that was undertaken to uh, on, on town councils, municipal councils, business associations. It, there was years of work that went into uh, changing the perception of the role of the mill and changing uh, uh, the attitude and the, the response to the environmental impact that the mill had. Um, that and the fact that uh, the mill had operated for 50 years, it was almost at the end of the life. In fact, it extended beyond the scheduled life of the facility. Uh, perhaps are more of the more substantial reasons why the decision was made. That and, and I think the, um, as previously mentioned, the, the, the increased impact and importance in the social role an economic role of the Mi'kmaq communities, Pictou Landing, First Nations included, that swayed the government to change its position with regard to the mill. So in the end, there is no pipe. The, fi the film is about a pipe that is that was not. And the pipe was simply a signifier of possible futures. And in the end, there is no pipe, and that's a good thing. So, um, Again, I, uh, uh, I ponder the uh, relationship between the documentary and my artistic education. And, and uh, uh, now at this point in time, I can sort of reflect on that. However, when I was making the film, I was convinced that there would be a pipe or could be a pipe. It was a concrete threat and there was no hesitation on my part and my part that was important to act as if there was going to be a pipe. 
Making the film was a way of engaging with the threat of the pipe. It was a way of acting. It was a way of being in the world. It was a way of uh, resisting the, the, the uh, what otherwise would be silence. Making the film was one of the few moments in my creative life. I had no doubt in what I was undertaking. I knew it would be a strong story. I knew I could pitch it to um, broadcasters. I knew it, it could have a chance to get financing, although in this day and age, getting any documentary made is a very risky undertaking. Um, and I really did want to get it on television because I wanted a lot of people to see it because I thought it was an important story. And, and furthermore, I think that it um, represented people who are very rarely represented. And I thought it's important, especially at this particular moment for those people to have representation. I had tremendous cooperation in making the film and I feel very, very fortunate to have been able to make it. And for once, I held back my distrust of the treachery of images. I trusted my mission. I didn't uh, overly analyze it. I didn't, I just went on gut instinct that this was doable and important to do. And now, if anything, the value of the documentary is that it captures a specific moment, a turning point, when the idea of the mill changed within that community. So how does this relate to NASCAD and to Gary? I think that the NASCAD that Gary created had enormous impact on me, my education. It fundamentally shook my ideas and expectations, not only of what art is, but also what the role of the artist is. And it really took me a long time to come to terms with this. I don't know if Gary was an objective realist, and I'm not sure if he was at all interested in philosophy in a deep level, although I know Jerry Ferguson, his compatriot, was. I think Gary was mainly an enthusiast from my perspective, a strategist, and I believe a very intuitive administrator, as well as being on his own a very substantial artist. But he believed in art, and I'm guessing he believed in art as a form of truth or as a way of grappling with the idea of truth. He was an advocate of art now, and the art bulletin announced what artists were visiting the school at that in any given day, and what would be uh, attended to now. So, if what was happening at NASCAD was an art of ideas, of analysis, and criticism, it was also um, something of an article of faith that art was important because ideas were important and ideas were concrete and could move mountains. Does that mean it was more spiritual than sensual as Adorno puts it? Does it offer, again, as Adorno puts it, something like freedom in the midst of unfreedom? I'm not sure, but that part of my education that I think has lasted for me is a great deal of faith in art and that in art there is a path towards testing what is true. And if anything today is a pressing political issue, it's indeed the demand for an understanding of one way of testing what is true. So for me, the now bulletin, the legacy of that is, continues to be a pathway to understanding what is true and also uh, something like freedom in the midst of unfreedom. So those are my comments at the moment. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk and engaging talk. I'd like to open it up now 
for questions from the audience. So as I mentioned, you are very welcome to write your questions in the Q&A function. And I also have the ability to unmute any of our participants. So if you would like to actually ask your question out loud, you can also indicate that and I'll go ahead and unmute you. But while we wait for some of those questions, um, David, I wonder, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, what are you working on now? And how has COVID affected your kind of practice and, and the projects that you have on the go? Uh, well, uh, uh, we're in the midst of uh, my partner, Catherine, uh, has been uh, working on a film by, uh, about uh, the artist Max Dean. Um, and that's been going on for the last few years. So we're coming to the point where we're uh, about to complete that project. So I'm putting my producer hat on um, uh, to get that project completed and out into the world. We hope that'll be out in 2021. Uh, we've also um, in 2020 uh, been involved in uh, building us our studio here in Picto and relocating from Toronto. And that's been a long-term plan, but it's certainly been accelerated by the pandemic. So it's been a period of uh, upheaval and change, and uh, but also a period where we're uh, putting out another film, so. But we have a few questions that have come in. Um, so I'm gonna read this first one out loud. Did your role as producer in many artist-related films make it easier for you to direct the mill? Uh, the answer to that yes is, is yes. Uh, uh, I guess part of the ambivalence about you know being a, an artist and uh, but having an artistic education and certainly again the uh, influence of Gary was that uh, you know the, you had this whole incident. Uh, the history of the artist administrator. And uh, uh, so, you know, basically after art school, I, I, I became very involved in artist run centers and was very involved in, in, uh, um, in running both an artist run center and also being involved in the National Association of Artist Run Centers and very involved with artist run centers across Canada. And then uh, subsequently I became uh, involved in other aspects of art administration, working at the Ontario Arts Council and then into Telefilm Canada. And so uh, those I all believe are part of my education and then uh, producing for independent uh, documentaries for the most part. Uh, yeah, you develop a you know, knowledge base uh, that um, not, involves not only the sort of the, the financing and administrative aspects, but also the practical aspects of, you know, what, what goes into uh, making a documentary and, and also uh, the form of documentary storytelling and uh, I mean, part of that is is also involved with uh, like watching a lot of films. So in my professional life, I've I've had the very great privilege of of working with a lot of artists, seeing a lot of uh, work, um, seeing a lot of films, uh, working with filmmakers, and uh, subsequently producing films. So. Uh, the moment I realized that what was taking place in Pickle County in 2017 would be a really great documentary story, I really did have a lot of confidence that I could put the pieces together and make it work. Thank you. We have a question here, David. Um, we're wondering if David can comment on how he sees the impact of his film on the conversation that now exists on industry, climate, and Indigenous land rights. Has it expanded the conversation? Yeah, I think part of the, 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 the for me, the importance of, the, of, the, of what took place in Pictou County is really, a, is really about that moment when, when people have to ask 
you know, uh, how much more can the environment take and how much more can we depend economically on, on resource extraction um, at this point in time. Uh, the, you know, the pragmatics of, uh, you know, the economic reality of, of what the mill was doing was that it was a very profitable and employed a lot of people and uh, had a tremendous infrastructure within Nova Scotia. And um, despite the declining resource that, uh, you know, the product they made was, was in high demand and uh, contributed to the, uh, you know, the GNP of the province in a significant way. So the decision to um, close, you know, not to extend Boat Harbor and not and forced the mill to close was extraordinary, uh, you know, and uh, and I think the government really has, and the premier has not really articulated in any great degree what what the rationale was for making that decision. I think he made a promise, and he's an extraordinary stubborn individual. And I think once he felt he had committed to course of action, he was very difficult to change direction, uh, despite the enormous amount of pressure he must have received from the various interests in the forest sector and beyond who wanted that mill to continue operating. But I, I think, uh, you know, on, on the other hand, it was a decision that must have been made, I can only presume it was, made uh, with, uh, with the goal of the greater benefit to the people of Nova Scotia being kept in mind. And that greater benefit is uh, we have to shift out of a resource economy because there's no long-term uh, guarantee that, that that economy is going to be uh, a future economy. Uh, as I say, you, can, you can't, you, you know, you can't base the future economy on, on resource extraction. It's just not tenable. And that, I mean, that does extend not only to uh, forestry, but it also to extends to fishery. I mean, you know, the loss of the cod fishery in the Atlantic Canada was probably the greatest warning sign possible to the globe about the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, potential disaster that's awaiting us with climate change. So, um, um, Definitely, uh, I thought the conversation and the, the articulate and, and intelligent way and the respectful way that people uh, conversed about um, the mill and the, the different positions on it was very important, not only because of the conversation, but the way the conversation was conducted. And the obvious, uh, success of, 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 of in making a change politically that was really significant and to the future of the province. Uh, and who would have anticipated that closing the mill was also going to be accompanied by a pandemic and who could anticipate that the pandemic was going to actually um, uh, create an economic and marketplace circumstances that mitigated the closure of the mill. And in fact, uh, with the creation of the Atlantic bubble, create a possible uh, way of uh, reorganizing the geopolitical reality of Atlantic Canada. So yeah, it was, uh, I think, you know, uh, the, it was the very general that was contained in the very specific in the, in the uh, story of the mill that was to me, very attractive in the long term. Thanks, David. We have a question here from uh, Griffin Art Project's director, Lisa Baldessera. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute Lisa. So Lisa, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hi, David. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you so much. That was my personal. I just want to follow up. I find it that the way that you're describing the reframing of this particular mill which is a kind of conceptual reframing that seems to relate to your NASCAD training, that it's not 
simply pragmatic, but it's sort of a fusion of that pragmatic um, and conceptual um, form that I think is really politically really key right now in Canada because we have a problem in the Canadian imaginary in terms of how we view ourselves um, and resources. So I just wondered, um, you know, it's a statement, but it's also sort of a question for you in terms of that question of the Canadian imaginary and what you learned in making this film about potential political actions that we can take um, that reflect your being able to reframe this particular mill in that imaginary way and conceptual way. So my question is really, you know, what would your guidance be in having made this film for other provinces which are dealing with exactly the same issue in Canada of how to really think about these resource extraction economies differently for the 21st century? So just a little question. Um, <laughs> But any part of that that you want to comment on, really, it's just a, just really fascinating for me the way you approach this. So, thank you. The important thing for me, uh, uh, you know, and and I don't know to to what degree, uh, you know, the influence of my education would be uh, on that, but uh, certainly um, there would be an an aesthetic component. Uh, and that aesthetic component would be, or a conceptual uh, component would be uh, things like, well, um, I did want to have, uh, you know, what I thought was unrepresented generally in media to be represented in media. So I, I, I certainly had the goal of, um, having this story told to a broadcast audience uh, with the idea that, um, that uh, you know, th that it, um, it would be something other than entertainment uh, and it would re represent people who would generally unrepresented or represented in a particular type of way in media. So, um, I knew that this story had drama, it had conflict, it had interesting characters, it had components that would be attractive to broadcast. But I think for me, what was important was what people would say. And uh, it became very, very clear to me that the people who were most accessible and most central to this issue were people who wanted to have their story told, who knew what their position was, who could articulate it very clearly. And even though they might not be studied and they might not be prompted and they might not be uh, uh, trained to perform for media, that they understood the impact of what they were saying and they were, had a very sophisticated knowledge of how they're how to express themselves on behalf of their community. So you know, uh, people like Chief Paul was very central uh, to the whole story, and and her cooperation made it possible to make the story. But also, uh, uh, you know, fishermen, um, and uh, you know. Uh, you know, you're always battling the idea of what, how to, you know, characterize people, and and uh, you know that was again my 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 fear of the uh, uh, treachery of images. I didn't, I, you know, I, I was really concerned about how to appropriately um, represent people, and what I found was it was quite easy because, uh, in a sense. Uh, because they were representing themselves with a great deal of sophistication and self-knowledge and, and they understood the impact of their words. And so uh, I could comfortably take the, the role of the, of the witness, the recordist, if it were. If I was the sort of recording secretary to a 
to a drama that was unfolding in which everybody was playing their part in a particular way. Uh, and yet uh, they were, that was crucial in understanding the dynamics of what the conflict and what the stakes were. So uh, it was important that, um, you know, for years there had been protests against the mill. Uh, for years, the decisions that governed the, the, whether the mill continued and, and what sort of land grants they were getting, what sort of monies they were getting from the, from the province was all done behind closed doors. And I think that, uh, that it's really important now and it's increasingly important now that uh, these communities tell their own story. And, and even over the couple of years since doing the mill, it, you, one realizes that, that uh, you know, the type of journalism now is changed fundamentally by the fact that people have cell phones. So you know, the recent conflicts between uh, you know, in the indigenous fishery, uh, much of that is represented by the people right in the middle and the center of that conflict themselves who are you know, standing witness to what's going on by putting a phone um, into the action. So uh, in a way, even my, you know, my idea of how to represent these uh, situations has been superseded by the fact that um, you know, history and technology have come together in a very interesting way. But I still think that there have to be uh, uh, greater representation in the media, greater use of the media, greater use of uh, investigating these particular issues um, that bring it to uh, a, attention. Uh, uh, I think that a lot of people, as I said here, locally just had no idea of the uh, complex economic nature of the uh, mills operation and that, you know, most of that product was uh, being <clears throat> sent overseas to China and, and, and Asia, I would say, uh, and that, uh, and, and it was uh, very much a market that was governed by, uh, you know, demand from that part of the world. And in an interesting way, the same impact has been taking place in the fishery where you know a great deal of the lobster, the market increase in the lobster in like 2016, 17, 18, the highest prices in history for, for lobster have been paid largely due because of export markets and those export markets primarily being in Asia. So, I mean, what's happening in our part of the world is very affected by uh, you know, markets that are governed by uh, other parts of the world. And, our understanding of just uh, how the resource industry works in Canada, I mean, people are just naive about it. And I think that it, that's the role of journalism and documentarians and artists and whoever else to, to, to um, bring these uh, stories in, uh, uh, to a greater audience and, and impact. So there's been a great deal of discussion about, uh, you know, uh, uh, the relationship between rural areas and urban areas and the fact that the resource there, uh, you know, comes from uh, uh, non-urban and rural and, and wilderness environments and, and that they serve, the resource markets serve urban uh, you know, uh, populations. So, there's a lot of stories to tell. It's a very particularly impactful uh, issue in Canada. Uh, you know, almost every pulp mill in Canada is on traditional um, indigenous land. Uh, and uh, the uh, impacts um, that are uh, from mining, et cetera, et cetera, have you know, a huge, huge impact, not only here, but around the world. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's a conversation that's going to just increasingly have uh, a role to play, but also the fact that it's enc encroaching more and more into our lives directly. Thank you so much, David. All right, I'm going to jump in here, David. Uh, we're just about at the hour mark, so I think um, now is a great time to just 
say thank you so much for your time today and your presentation and your very engaging talk um, on behalf of the Griffin team. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us here today. Um, Griffin has um, an exciting lineup of public programs, so be sure to check out our website. I believe our next program is on Sunday, November 29th, and it's an open studio with our current artist in residence, um, Kelly Lichen. So if you're interested, be sure to sign up. And I should also mention that the galleries open every Saturday from noon till five. So if you are in fact in the North Vancouver, Vancouver area, um, please do stop by and say hello. Okay, well, thank you again, David, and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation. Bye now. Bye.